If I was to go out in the street and just ask a simple, basic question to every stranger that I met and ask them, do you believe in Jesus? What do you think that they would say? Now, statistically, sadly, that number that's going to answer yes is dwindling. And we need to be aware of that. But actually, we still would encounter a lot of people who would say yes. But if my desire is to see people come to the freedom that I know in Christ, is that yes good enough? Do I stop the question there? And that's really where we're going to begin today. I've been thinking about my testimony again a lot recently, and and that is what just naturally propels me to want to share with other people. And it's been, I've said it up here before, and maybe you've not heard it before, but I was someone who moved around a little bit, and I got to be kind of a bit of a wallflower in high school, and I was an introvert. Those of you that know me now might think that's a little bit weird, but I was an introvert then. I didn't really want to talk to anybody, and I had this understanding of God that I had gotten and picked up from little bits of church that, yes, God was real. Yes, I believed in Jesus, but the Bible tells us the demons believe in Jesus, right? I believed in Jesus, And I thought I was supposed to live this perfect life, and I knew that I couldn't. I was facing that reality. And it wasn't until, of all things, in a public school, we were required to go to a club setting. One of many, and one of those many options looked kind of easy. It was the first priority club. So I went there, and I thought, all right, this is going to be easy. I'm just going to sit here. I'm going to hear a message. You know, I like God. This is going to be okay. And I I heard the gospel explained to me, and I heard about grace, that of course you can't live that perfect life, but Jesus lived it for you. He wants you to submit to him, and then he's going to cover you in his righteousness and change you from the inside out. And so I said, yeah, that's what I want. And it, it, it's just natural. If we really believe that, then we should want other people to feel that relief that we felt when we figured out, oh, you know what? I can't do it, but I don't have to. So if somebody on the street talks to me and they says, yes, I'm going to want to hear their testimony just like that, or I'm going to want to hear something like that, right? That they have trusted in Jesus. But I'm going to ask a clarifying question because a lot of people are not going to know the word testimony. I'm going to ask, who do you think Jesus is? Because they could believe in a lot of different Jesuses. And we want to make sure that they and we are believing in the right Jesus. Now, a few years ago, we have a missionary we support, Tony Grulet with Radical Truth. He actually came here and he did this message. So I stole his image Uh, It's fabricating Jesus was the message, how cults distort the gospel of Christ. And his whole message began with this idea that there are lots of Jesuses out there. So just because someone tells you that they believe in Jesus doesn't mean they believe in the same Jesus that you do. And he used a humorous example. Some of you instantly know what this movie is. And I promise you right off the bat, this is not like some kind of pastoral endorsement of this movie. I don't remember the bad words in it or the the inappropriate parts. I do remember laughing quite a bit. I'll confess that. This is Talladega Nights and this is Ricky Bobby played by Will Ferrell. And he has this prayer. And Tony played that clip for us. He has it on his YouTube channel. And when he goes to churches and talks about cults, he plays this particular clip because it's really important. You see, Ricky Bobby, he, play, he prays specifically to baby Jesus. He talks about little infant Jesus. And he even asks, he says, Jesus, would you use your magic baby Jesus powers to heal his father-in-law and his weird leg? And his wife calls him out for being odd about it. Like, whoa, whoa, he grew up. And eventually his father-in-law calls him out. Whoa, Jesus grew up. But he says, I like the Christmas Jesus best and I'm saying grace. When you say grace, you can pray to whatever Jesus you want. This argument continues and his friend, he says, he and his friend is named Cal. He says, I like to picture Jesus in one of those t-shirts with a printed on tuxedo so that Jesus is both professional and ready to party. And the kids weigh in. I like to picture Jesus like this. And you see where this is going. Are they identifying who Jesus is? Or are they projecting who Jesus wants to be? And then praying to that instead. Now this was done in there to show a bit of humor in the movie. And also to show you that that character was not the brightest light bulb in the coal bucket. Okay? He did not have things figured out. But it reflects something that really happens. Tony started with cults, and this is very true in cults. If you go and you find the the LDS, they claim that Jesus was God, but a God, not the God. He was not one with the God. God was not triune. There was different gods. In fact, there's a long line of gods, they claim, even before the one that we know. 
That doesn't make sense. That doesn't match with the Bible. Jehovah's Witnesses claim that Jesus was really Michael the archangel, and he took on like a special duty, and he was on a special assignment, and he was the brother to Lucifer. I don't see that anywhere in Scripture. The World Mission Society Church of God, and they're going to come up to you around here in Visalia and talk to you in the Walmart parking lot and ask you if you know about Mother God. That's these people. Uh, They think Jesus was reincarnated as their leader, Aung San Hong. And so they think he's an Asian man, and they think God the Mother is this Asian woman who's alive today named Ong Gila. And of course, I don't see any of that in Scripture, so they can talk and say, I love Jesus, but they're not talking about the Jesus we're talking about. And in fact, if you talk to a Muslim individual, they can tell you that they love Jesus, but they're going to tell you that Jesus was a Muslim. I'd like to explain how chronology works to them, because Islam wasn't around yet, so that doesn't make any sense. But I'd like to do that with love. But it goes beyond the cults. It actually penetrates all of society, so-called secular society, when people have this idea of a hippie or socialist Jesus. Sometimes he's effeminate. And then we have other people who have a Jesus in their head that, man, he's got that AK strapped to him, and he is waving the American flag, and he's got a trucker hat on. And neither of those are actually right. And so we need to address both of those. And it even goes into the church. When we have ideas that float around of a Jesus that doesn't call us to a hard sacrificial life, but instead is almost our butler. And then we also have the idea of Jesus on the flip side who seems callous and cold and it doesn't want to be involved in our life. Now we want to find out who Jesus is and follow that Jesus. Just because they say Jesus doesn't mean they mean the same Jesus. If I tell you that a message is coming from this pulpit from a guy named Sam Bowie from Kentucky, I could be talking about two different guys. I was named after another Sam Bowie from Kentucky. If you want somebody to shoot and play basketball with, you want the other one because he was picked before Michael Jordan in the draft. But I've never heard that guy deliver a sermon, so I hope that you would choose for me to continue to be your minister. But we have the same name, but it's not a name that defines a person. Who we are is deeper than just a name. And so we need to get to the characteristics of Jesus. We need to know who he is, what his essence is. So let's ask that important question. Who is Jesus? And that's where we're going to go today in Luke chapter 9. Now, when Luke covers this issue, it actually flows naturally. So if you weren't here last week, don't worry about it. We're just going to give you a little summary. It kind of flows naturally from last week and a few weeks ago when we were looking. Because at this point, Jesus has already declared who he is, really, in several ways. Luke is called an orderly account. And he is largely, not perfectly, largely putting things in chronological order And he's pulled the apostles to himself. He sent them out on a mission. That's what the word apostle means, apostelos. He sent them out like missionaries. And they've come back. And that's even made Herod wonder, is this John the Baptist raised from the dead? This is kind of a beginning hook that Luke has kind of left dangling that he's going to answer as we read today. Uh, But we also have just had several people traveling, and they're traveling down to the Passover, and they encountered a Jesus near, or Jesus near Bethsaida, and he did a miracle there. He took five loaves of bread and two fish and miraculously multiplied them to feed over 5,000 men and their families with 12 baskets full of leftovers. Now, we dove deep last week. We mentioned how that connected to the Old Testament and the New Testament and how this helps show that these were eyewitness accounts. But please don't forget the very practical. They were possibly intimidated, at least Philip was, by a big need. But we should trust in an immense God when we have that big need. Don't be scared by that. So the application, of course, was give God your time, talent, and treasure. No matter how small they are, he can do great things with them. But if you saw that miracle, put, it in, put yourself in their shoes. They're going to pass over remembering that God is, has saved Israel. And they're wondering and looking around, who's going to save us from Rome? God's got to show up and do something. And then they see this miracle of multiplication. And it connects with the Old Testament. It connects with a prophet. Are they wondering, this man has to be a prophet. But are they figuring out that he's more? So let's read on. Luke 9, starting in verse 18. And it happened that while he was praying alone, the disciples were with him. Now, Luke is summarizing. And so Matthew 16 and Mark 7, let us know if we look at everything together that a little bit of time has passed. And Luke is really summarizing along and following that thought. There's this dangling idea. Is Jesus a prophet or is he a prophet risen from the dead that Luke has in his mind? 
And when we look at Matthew 16 and Mark 7, we know that some time has passed and they're actually in Caesarea Philippi. They've moved to Gentile territories and Jesus has even warned them about the Pharisees and how they're corrupt, but how corrupt leadership actually spreads corruption. So he's warned them of these things and they're together as a traveling band, but Jesus is a little bit off from himself or by them and he's just kind of praying. Now, judging from what we know about the disciples, those 12, we don't know what they're talking about, but it wouldn't surprise me if they're talking about who Jesus is or maybe even which of them did better on one of these missionary trips, right? We see that, them kind of jockeying for position. And at some point, Jesus stops his silent prayer. And by the way, I just got to pause and say, if Jesus is modeling our perfect life that we need to learn from and be more like, if Jesus has to have both community time with individuals and silent prayer, guess what? We need to have community time together as well as prayer. If we don't spend time together in church, we're going to be spiritually unhealthy. If we don't spend time in personal prayer and personal study, we're also going to be unhealthy. So follow Jesus' examples here. And he's going to pop up from that prayer time and he's going to ask a question. And that question is one of the ways that Jesus teaches. He teaches using questions. So keep that in mind when you're trying to convince someone of someone else, very, uh, of something else. Oftentimes, it's not statements that are going to do it. It's questions. And this is what he asks. And he questioned them, saying, who do the people say that I am? They answered and said, John the Baptist. And others say, Elijah. But others, that one of the prophets of old has risen again. Now, we read this with modern eyes. Some of us may think of reincarnation a lot, of, a lot of times when we see like prophets of old, stuff like that. Certain modern people have tried to tie that to the Bible. Since we're talking about worldviews and Jesus, and we even mentioned uh, that you know, some people are out there claiming that Jesus was reincarnated, I, I want to let you know that that wasn't part of the worldview of the, the Jewish person at the time that the Bible was written. They didn't think of reincarnation. You see, a worldview is kind of like a puzzle. Puzzles have lots of pieces and they go together in a certain way. They have little hooks and, and crannies and all these things and they, they peg into one another and you place them together. And if you actually try to put a puzzle piece from another puzzle all together, it's not going to fit. And your goal is to take those little pieces and make sure that they match the final project or the, the final image, the image on the front of the box. Puzzle time and puzzle solving time is not free reign creativity where you take what you like like a buffet style. And so they would have not thought of reincarnation. That doesn't fit in the biblical worldview, right? And we see in the New Testament, you know, absent from the body, present with the Lord for Christians. So the Jewish people believed in a sort of ramping up cycle pattern of fulfillments of prophecy. And so it was for them when they're thinking of Elijah, and they are thinking of Elijah coming back because of Malachi 4, 5, behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. They're thinking that either, since Elijah didn't die, he's going to come back in person because Elijah had this kind of what we might call a mini personal rapture, just like Enoch did. And they're going to think either that or someone very much like him is going to come back and he's going to have that same role. And we see that that's what's happening. John the Baptist filled that role. Now, very interesting and kind of a side the point, uh, side point, that is one fulfillment. That doesn't mean it's the final fulfillment. Lots of folks and it fits very well with the Jewish idea, would say, well, Elijah's probably one of those two guys that show up in Revelation mysteriously because it's appointed once a person to die and Elijah hadn't died yet. So maybe Elijah and Enoch kind of picked up and moved through time. Interesting stuff, not the main point today, but the point is, is they weren't thinking that Jesus was somebody reincarnated. They were thinking he was coming like someone, that if he wasn't the Messiah, maybe he was heralding somebody else that was going to be the Messiah. We see that reflected in John's question, are you the one or is there somebody else coming? So they knew he was something important, but they couldn't figure out exactly who he was for sure. At least many people did. Lots of people are saying all kinds of things about Jesus. But here's the thing, of how to de here's the thing about how to determine truth. We don't take a popular survey. We don't invite everybody to participate. All right, what do you think two plus two equals? And then when everybody comes in and says it's five, we don't go, all right, it's five. No, two plus two equals four. And we know this even if a lot of people don't. Now, on that one, hopefully we've not wavered, but there are other obvious truths that can be demonstrated that people do try to deny. 
And he wanted to pull out not what the crowd wanted to hear. He wanted to see if they were able to verify the truth. He wanted to see if they had the right answer. And it's really good. If you can get someone to give a right answer out of their own mouth, not only do they learn it, but they learn it and keep it longer because they were the one that was able to say it. They're going to forget your words quicker than they forget their own. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said, the Christ of God. Now, sometimes we treat Christ as a last name. It's not. It's actually an adjective. It's, it literally means anointed. It's Christos. And it comes from a Greek word. It's a Greek word, and it really correlates to a Hebrew word in the Old Testament, this idea of anointing. A priest might be anointed for a task, but Jesus wasn't just an anointed. He was the anointed, or as that popular uh, TV show or series now, he is the chosen, not just a chosen. And so this, was, this means he was the Messiah. And his task that he was chosen for was to be the king and the savior. Now, Luke is summarizing it, and they're likely speaking in Hebrew or Aramaic, and Luke's writing it down in Koine Greek. And so he's including this of God to help us make a connection between Jesus and and God. But I actually think for us non-Greek speakers, it's probably easier to pick up on what's being said in Matthew's summary. He includes a few more words. So let's look there. Matthew 16, 16. Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Barjona, by the way, bar is son. Jonah, even though it's an H, it's, it's Jonah, like a name. It's Simon, son of Jonah. Because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So what's happening very clearly is there's this contrast with Simon, son of a person, and Jesus, son of God. He is the Christ of God. He is the son of God. They understood that he was of the same essence as God the Father, even though he was a distinct personality. Right? God is one what? That's God and three who's. And that sounds weird to us, but think about it this way. You're one what and one who and you get lonely. God has three who's and he's never lonely. And he's always in perfect tri-unity. Right? Now, Peter probably suspected this already. They were already noticing all the miracles that he was doing. They were noticing he could calm the seas. They were noticing he could multiply things, cast out demons, and heal people. But at some point, Peter got this supernatural deposit of information. A confirmation that what, his hope, what he was hoping why he had left his family and was willing to follow this rabbi everywhere, it was true. He was the Messiah. But he wasn't just the Messiah. He was God incarnate. And so you're going to hear a lot of people say things about Jesus. They're going to say, like an interview with Elon Musk, the Babylon Bee did a few, uh, maybe it's been a year ago now, oh, oh, I believe in Jesus as a a good teacher. I believe in Jesus as a a great miracle worker, some people will say. But if they don't believe in Jesus that is God and man, then they're believing in a different Jesus than it is required for them to believe in to be saved. Because Jesus, who Jesus is, he says, I am the truth, the life, and the way. No man can come to the Father but through me. Not just anybody named Jesus will work. No, through him, through who he is. So to summarize both conversations, he is the promised Messiah. And that's good. And he's also God because only God could perfectly live out a perfect life that would then be required to have victory over our sins and pay for all of those things that we have done wrong. And so back in Luke, Jesus is going to tell them something strange. But he, wanted, he warned them and instructed them not to tell this to anyone. When we read this in the Gospels, it's often confusing. Well, We've got this great commandment, this great commission in Matthew 28 and in the end of the chapter where we're, Jesus says, I have all authority, so you go out and make disciples everywhere. Well, why, why is he telling them not to tell anyone? Well, the answer is clear as we read lots of sources together. He's trying to make sure that the timing of the crucifixion is just right. So this is, don't tell anyone just yet. There's going to be an appropriate time to tell everyone. But for now... That is not the point that he is wanting to communicate with the people where he is at. 
Now, saying, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised raised up on the third day. Now, we can see allusions to this and prophecy about this in Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53. And still yet at the time that Jesus was saying these words, when they were looking for the Messiah, they weren't looking for the suffering servant. They didn't think that Jesus was going to die. The Messiah was going to die. They thought the Messiah was going to show up, pull out a sword and conquer Rome. And so Jesus is telling them something that is challenging their expectations and their understanding about God. Now, if you want to grow, and I hope you've had these experiences, you no doubt, if you are growing in Jesus, you've had these moments where you've had to look and go, huh, I once thought this, but I've been confronted by truth and I have to change my mind. Maybe it's about Jesus and and God. Maybe it's about the Bible. Maybe it's about a particular passage. Maybe it's just about how the world works. When you get more information, you should adjust your understanding to match reality. Sometimes it's a big shift, and sometimes it's just a more accurate understanding. But this is what's happening here. At the time, there was a Bible teaching that was pretty popular, essentially, about what the Messiah was going to do, and they had just got a misinterpretation. And so they needed to change their interpretation to match reality. Now watch where Luke goes. From Jesus is going to die to this. And he was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one that will save it. Put yourself in their shoes. He hadn't been crucified yet. For us, this would have been like hearing, all right, whoever wants to follow me, and these are the people that are following him already, that have seen him do miracles, that are calling him teacher, rabbi. These are his students. He said, if you want to follow me, every morning when you get up, strap yourself into an electric chair. It would sound bizarre, but that's what he's calling for, a brutal form of execution. Now, they would later learn what this meant. And out of the 12 apostles, of course, Judas would betray Jesus. And then we had 10 of them getting martyred. And John, John would have the martyrdom of a long life. He would die of natural, call, um, call, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, natural causes based on what we can read. But he actually watched a lot of first, second, and even third generation Christians die. If the timeline adds up right, based on the writings we have from the early church, he actually watched who we think of as young Timothy get dragged out into the streets in Ephesus and stoned to death. I think John had it worse. He lived so long, he got to watch all these people he, he led to the Lord and other people led to the Lord. All his brothers, all those who were there with him in Christ die one by one. He lived a living sacrifice of his life. It was, had to be in a long life of God's will, not mine. And that's what we are called to do. That's what Jesus is calling us to do. If you want to follow me, there is sacrifice in following me. This is the stone uh, table from the Chronicles of Narnia. And it's C.S. Lewis's way of representing the cross. And it's an altar. And Aslan, representing Jesus, died on this to pay for Edmund's sin, a character in Narnia. You see, we have to be living sacrifices, but you know what the problem with a living sacrifice is? It keeps crawling off of the altar. This is why I'm confused when we hear certain slogans in the world today. Because if we really are a Christian, that means we're submitting to Jesus as the King of Kings. So I shouldn't hear Christians say things like, my body, my choice. I can love them and certainly understand why non-Christians think that. But if you're a Christian... It isn't supposed to be your body anymore. It's supposed to be his. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own, for you have been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. That means following Christ is a cost, a a heavy cost, a major cost. It means putting Jesus first. It means serving others. It means putting other people over our personal preferences and our comfort levels. But it's worth it. And Jesus answers the concerns back in Luke with this. For what what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself or his soul? I almost started just out of instinct reading from King James, even though NASB was in front of me, because I remembered that. And many of us remember that. 
A lot of people pursue wealth, they pursue happiness, they pursue all this kind of stuff. And you know what happens? You can't take any of that stuff with you. Yes, pursuing Jesus is costly, but it's worth it. It's the eternal relationship that can go with you beyond the grave, where all that other stuff can just keep you happy on the way to the grave. And you know what? A lot of times those things end up owning you, and that happiness is so temporary and fleeting, and you might find yourself bitter and frustrated with it because we are designed to worship someone And when we worship things, and when we worship people, then things get all askew and we become miserable. But when we start doing what we were designed to do, we find a joy that goes beyond the understanding of those who are not doing it. Let's continue on. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him where he comes in his glory, and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But I say to you truthfully, there are some of those standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. And we're going to pick up on that last part next week. Maybe a reference to the transfiguration or maybe a reference to the start of the church or Jesus' resurrection. There's lots of different views on that. But either way, the disciples are going to see some amazing things that are going to launch them into a career of self-sacrificial living and ministry. It wasn't something they just did on Sunday. It wasn't a club they belonged to. It was their every moment of every life, of, the, of all of their lives. They were surrendered. But... For now, let's focus on that ashamed part. We may not be claimed to be ashamed of him, but Jesus also says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So we should be making sure that we're checking ourselves and that we're doing those things, that we're not quieting unpopular opinions that Jesus teaches us are true because the world doesn't like them. Now, we need to be loving when we share truth, but we need to be bold, and we need to keep making sure that we are staying on that altar as a living sacrifice and doing his will. Now, two important things that I hope you take away, okay? Now, stick with me just a minute. Jesus says this, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who asks, or he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. This world is going to say a lot about Jesus. Don't let the world define him. Don't let your parents define him for you. Don't let your kids define him for you. Don't do any of that. Here's the application for yourself. Pursue Jesus for who he is. Don't redefine him to your liking or let the world do it. Adjust yourself to the real Jesus. But once you find him, Luke made it natural. We just automatically should start serving him once we understand what he's done for us. And one of the key ways we need to serve him, especially in a city where we have 56,000 admitted non-Christians, is to go out there and connect with those non-Christians. So what I want you to do, rather than just say, hey, do you go to church anywhere? Or do you know who Jesus is? Or do you believe in God? To get more to the heart of the matter, I want you to say this. Who do you think Jesus is? Because if they have the right answer to that and they go to a different church, that's okay. I don't care if they worship with tambourines, a cappella, or have drums on stage. Those are non-essentials. I don't care if they have a little bit more Pentecostal fire than we do. Or if I grew up in a Baptist church and we used to joke that that church was actually going to be the first to be raised from the dead because the Bible says that the dead in Christ rise first. Right? I don't care what end of the spectrum on those things. If they're a brother or sister... They can disagree on end times. All right, well, good. Praise the Lord. I've met a brother or sister. I'll see you here, there, in the air. But if they've got a weird answer, if they have a non-biblical answer, then you have your starting place and you know where they are spiritually. And you can say, well, why do you think that? Would you like to talk about it? And maybe you can hear something in there and ask another follow-up question. Or maybe you can get to the point where you can ask, can I tell you why I'm convinced that the Jesus of the Bible is true and why I follow him? And then you can share your testimony. So again, pursue Jesus, the real Jesus. And then ask others who he is. So if they don't know him, you can invite them to follow Jesus alongside you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, help us to be a missional community. Help us each, wherever we are, to know you better and closer. And help transform us by that. And then send us out. Many people are suffering because of rain. And and many people are suffering because of homelessness. Many people are suffering because of bad ideas that they hold. Help us to see people with the love that you have. And want to reach out to them. And help them connect with you. 
so that they can find that joy that surpasses momentary circumstances. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.